Hey everybody. Hey Kevin. Come on in here. Good to see you. Tyler, you're always so fast. In Cafe 2020, nobody has faster fingers than you do. Hey Jack, good to see you. Thanks for inviting your followers. Well, welcome to Coffee with Scott Adams. And today will be probably the best simultaneous sip of your life. I, I feel as though they just keep getting better. And you don't need much. All you need to participate in the simultaneous sip is, say it with me, sing along. A cup or a mug or a glass, a snifter, stein, chalice, tanker, this thermos, flask, canteen, grail, goblet, vessel of any kind. Fill it with your favorite liquid. I like coffee. And join me now for the don't be mean hit of the day, the thing that makes everything better. The simultaneous sip. Go. Oh, sublime. Well, let's talk about all the news. We've got a lot of funny stuff happening. My favorite story. <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything funnier than people who were on the other team making mistakes. <laughs> I don't know why I find that especially funny. Because you, you get the humor element, but you get the schadenfreude at the same time. It's not just funny. It's funny and it's bad for people on the other team. So Matt Lewis, who is apparently uh, a very vocal never-Trumper, proudly tweets that they have decided to turn President Trump's comment that never-Trumpers are, quote, human scum, they decided to cleverly flip it around, turn it from a negative into a positive. Because you've seen other people do that, right? Remember when Hillary Clinton called uh, Trump supporters deplorable? Well, within minutes, there were hats and T-shirts that said, I'm a deplorable I'm an adorable deplorable. We're all deplorables. And it worked really well, didn't it? Turned a negative into a positive. And so Matt Lewis and the Never Trumpers, I'm not sure exactly who was behind the shirt, decided to do the same play, except it was the same play without understanding what makes the play work, which is the funny part. <laughs> now... When Hillary Clinton said Trump supporters are deplorable, consider that word, deplorable. We all know that what it means is somebody who's got bad qualities in, in some sense. But does the word itself have much baggage with it? It does not. <laughs> the, word, the word itself is just kind of cute. I'm deplorable. You know, you're a little deplorable, too. You know who else is deplorable? My spouse. We're all deplorable. Just the word sounds cute. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think there's one Trump supporter who heard the word deplorable and never thought, well, that's bad. <laughs> it just sounds funny. So when the Trump supporters almost universally said, yeah, let's make a shirt out of this business, they were accurately and correctly saying to themselves, this word doesn't really work as an insult, but it works really well as a, as a, a rallying cry. And so they flipped it around, turned it from a negative into a positive, and may actually have been a, a, one of the important keys to Trump's victory, uh, because it certainly painted Hillary in a bad light. And so we see the Never Trumpers, seeing how successful it is when, and I think there's some other examples that don't come to mind, where people have flipped around something. Like, remember when fake news was uh, a term used against President Trump and against everybody on his side? And then the president took that fake news and he, he flipped it around and made it something that was an insult to his opponents and sold it and branded it. And now you barely remember that it was ever used against him because he flipped it around successfully. So wouldn't the never-Trumpers love to do that? Wouldn't they like to take something and just flip it around? 
So they tried to do this <laughs> by, <laughs> by making a T-shirt. That I'm not even making this up. I swear to God, they actually did this. This says on the front of the shirt, proud to be... <laughs> <laughs> this says on the shirt, proud to be human scum. <laughs> proud to be human scum. Never Trump 2020. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh. Forget about the fact that Never Trump 2020 includes in it as the operative part of the phrase Trump 2020. <laughs> it actually says Trump 2020 on their shirt. Now, it says Never Trump, but if I've taught you anything, the brain doesn't process words like you know, not and never. It, it just sort of flushes those upon delivery. So, so the, the opposition to Trump is producing a shirt that actually says Trump 2020 on it. And that's not even the worst part of it. <laughs> the worst part of it is, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> the lettering, you have to see the lettering. So look at my, tw <laughs> look at my Twitter feed. Uh, look at my Twitter feed. And see the actual picture of the shirt. <laughs> they made the lettering look like sperm. <laughs> it actually looks like a sex accident happened on the shirt. And it just happened to form, form the letters human scum on, a, on an adorable gray shirt. <laughs> God, oh, best day ever. Uh, and that's not even the funniest thing that happened today. <laughs> oh, uh, let's go, let's go on. Uh, apparently, there was a study that found that uh, people who watch uh, Fox News think the economy of the United States is doing pretty well, and people who watch MSNBC mostly don't think the economy is doing well. <laughs> People who watch MSNBC don't even know they live in the country with the world's strongest economy of all time. <laughs> of all time. The world's strongest economy in 13.8 billion years of, of, I don't know, the universe. <laughs> and there's never been a stronger economy than ours right now. And the people who watch MSNBC don't even know they're living in a country with the strongest economy in the history of civilization. Ah, uh, so that was funny. Now, what about this Katie Hill story? Are you watching that? <laughs> Are you, so Katie Hill, I guess she's a politician, California politician, and she had a, a, an interesting uh, personal life, which included some men and some women and her, a husband and a girlfriend at the same time. And apparently it was okay with the husband. And uh, some other, I don't know, some other rumors around that. But the, the fun part is that there are photos of her, uh, one where she's naked and brushing the hair of a, a woman she has some relationship with. And another one where she's naked and doing a bong. And I was looking at this and I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure this was designed to make me like her less. <laughs> but I, I, I think, uh, I don't think this really works as a negative in California. You know, a, as a Californian, I can speak to this with some authority. The fact that there are naked pictures of somebody smoking a bong or having a relationship a woman having a relationship with another woman and another man at the same time. There's not a single negative in that at all. <laughs> There's not a single negative. Now there are other, you know, other complaints about her that have some substance, but 
I don't think this hurt her at all. I, I've got a feeling that her uh, earnings potential went up. Now, there's some people who are, who are saying we don't want to tweet the pictures because it's, um, it's revenge porn. But I've never seen revenge porn that worked to the benefit of the alleged victim. I'm pretty sure she's going to come out of this ahead, one way or another. One way or another. I think she's going to come out of this ahead. Anyway, uh, I have nothing negative to say about her. I just think that, uh, uh, well, I think that she just got a, a little more interesting. And as a California politician, I don't know if it'll make any difference at all. Let's talk about the shift skiff coup. Shift skiff coup. The shampeachment, if you will. That's right. This hashtag shampeachment. It's a sham of an impeachment. Um, here's my persuasion take on that. The day it was announced that there was going to be this impeachment, I don't know, inquiry or whatever they're going to call it so it doesn't sound like impeachment, the day it was announced was a bad day for President Trump. The second day was another bad day for President Trump. Third day, another bad day for President Trump. Every day this secret skiff impeachment thing was a story seemed like a bad day for President Trump. But here's a little trick about human uh, perception. And this is one of the, I talked about this in my book, uh, Win Bigly. It's one of the most uh, useful things you can ever learn about how people think. And it goes like this. People can get used to anything. We can get used to anything. So the fact that there are people in this secret thing talking about things that they say are bad for Trump, we're kind of going to get used to it. But you know what we're not going to get used to as easily? is the continuous news stories about how the process is counter to democracy, the Constitution, or whatever the critics are going to say. So I feel as though the early part of this Schiff skiff coup was successful for Schiff. But it seems like, and here's the main point I want to make, I believe that time has started to shift the story so that the longer it goes without producing something meaningful, and that's the key. If it produces a story that has some substance, well, that changes everything. But the longer they go with doing something that looks sketchy without producing the goods, the worse it is for the Democrats. And that worsening will continue to worsen. It's going to get really bad. Now, if you see that the government is doing some investigation on something and there are people complaining about the process of the investigation, you're not going to care too much about the process complaints, even if you agree with them a little bit, if it turns out that what the investigation finds is real and there's something there that really matters. If that were the case... Nobody's going to care too much about the process. Maybe that will enter into the legal, the legal elements, but not to the public. But what if the process continues day after day after day and it doesn't produce anything, at least nothing we didn't already know? At the same time, the people like Matt Gates, who are very cleverly turning this into a uh, a story about the abuse of power and the abuse of the system and the abuse of this or that. Again, whether or not those are valid complaints or invalid complaints is not relevant to what my point is. My point is not the factual you know, accuracy of any of this, but rather how does the public feel about it? So I think we've the, the, the Matt Gaetz uh, stunt, as, as the opponents are calling it, his stunt of bringing all the Republicans to march down to the skiff and, you know, sort of protest and do a sit-in and eat pizza and stuff. The critics are saying, oh, it's a stunt, it's a stunt. Well, it was exactly a stunt. Nobody, I don't think Matt Gates would disagree that it was a stunt 
for the cameras and for the purpose of, you know, political perception, that was exactly what it was. It's not like anybody's hiding that, that it was um, a stunt, if you will, a technique to get attention to their side of the, uh, of the story. And it worked wonderfully. I, I thought that uh, it probably was a turning point between Schiff winning every day, because he's got this story, there's something bad brewing here, to why has it been so long and we're not hearing any of the goods, or at least nothing that seems reliable at this point, uh, but the process is still crooked. So time has, uh, is now on uh, the president's side. The longer Schiff does this, the more he becomes the face of the Democratic Party, which is not a good look. It also smells of desperation. Again, if the, if the process had immediately kicked up some big story, you wouldn't care about the process so much, even if it was imperfect. But as long as it doesn't, it starts to smell over time. You know, it's like this good carton of milk. Day one, mm, fresh milk, yum, put it on my cereal. Day 30, your milk is turned. Your milk has turned. So I think the milk is turning for Schiff. And there, there's some funny context going on here. Uh, one is the, the biggest context is that we have news that Durham and his investigation have, have um, they've evolved it into an actual criminal investigation. Now, we don't know any details of you know, who he's talked to exactly, at least in terms of the total number of people he's talked to. But it starts to change the story, doesn't it? So now we're going to have the, the stories that are competing for your attention will be Schiff Skiff producing nothing, right? Uh, Matt Gates and people who are, pr- are complaining about the process probably creating new news every day. So the people complaining about the process have a little bit of an advantage, but their advantage just went into... Uh, another level, because their story starts to fit in with, wait a minute, not only is this process crooked, but the whole way we even got to where we are might be because of another crooked process. It might have involved, you know, Clapper and Brennan and Comey in some way, who knows, you know, we'll, we'll find out if, if they did or did not do anything illegal. But it's the question people are, are asking, it's what the news is talking about, so now you've got Schiff and his little skiff producing nothing while the Matt Gates people are producing story after story about the process being rotten while the Durham story just took a new level of interest. It's also talking about people being rotten. At the same time, we're waiting for the Horowitz report on the FISA abuses, which is more about that side being rotten. So the, the news has turned into, what does Schiff have? Well, we don't know. It's in that little skiff, and if it were anything important, we probably would have heard about it by now. So his thing went from a pretty good play to rotten milk. And he's just sitting there in that rotten milk thinking, I better come up with something new, because what I'm doing is getting old really fast. <laughs> so there's a timer running on Schiff. Every day it's getting worse for him if he doesn't produce. Meanwhile, these other news stories about Horowitz and Durham are probably going to produce story after story about, wait for it, here's the fun part. Who would you say is the face of the Democratic Party? Well, during Obama's administration, you would say Obama. You might say it's the candidates running for president now, but they're so diluted. You know, it's, you can't really say Elizabeth Warren is the face of the Democratic Party, can you? Because I don't know that she's going to you know, get elected. She's sort of more radical than the party is. So who's, who is the brand of the, the Democrats? Well, I'll bet you didn't see this coming. But who do you think of when you think of uh, the Schiff-Skiff? Schiff. 
Who do you think of when you think of the big stories about impeachment? Nadler, Schiff, Nadler. Who do you think of when you're thinking of the Durham investigation? Clapper, Brennan, Comey. Are you seeing any pattern yet? Look for the pattern. Who do you think of when you hear about the Horowitz report on the FISA potential abuses? Comey, Brennan, Clapper, Schiff, Nadler. What do they all have in common? They're all old white guys. The exception would be Pelosi. And what is, what is Pelosi's role in all this? Well, has anybody ever accused Pelosi of being part of the deep state machinations against Trump? Surprisingly, no, right? A- am I right or wrong? Do a fact check on me. Has anyone ever accused Pelosi of being part of the deep state? I don't believe I've ever heard that. The deep state, which is now becoming sort of the accidental face of the Democrats, only because of the stories that are being told. You know, the Schiff Skiff, impeachment, Horowitz, Durham, even the people doing the investigating are all old, old white guys. So if you're the Democrats, how are you feeling about your brand being identified because of the news as being a bunch of old white guys who may not have been playing straight. So I've got a feeling that the Democrat brand is just uh, circling the drain right now uh, because it turned into an old white men breaking the law brand, which is literally the opposite of what they want it to be. You could not be more opposite. Let me tell you this. If you're, a, if you're a, a typical Democrat, let's say you're an ordinary Democrat. Now, when I say an ordinary Democrat, I'd say you're, you, know, you have a high likelihood of being female, and you have a pretty good likelihood, I don't know what the percentage is, of being a person of color. So if you're a Democrat, there's a good chance you're one of those two things, woman, person of color, both, something like that. And you're looking at the story and saying, there's an awful lot of old white guys who seem to be breaking the law. How do you feel about that? Is that your team? Are you going to stick up for the old white guys breaking the law? I don't think so. I got a feeling that Biden, Clapper, and Comey might get thrown under the bus pretty hard by the Rachel Maddows of the world should they, should they be identified as having broken any laws. That is... Still short of the case, but there are people looking into stuff. Eh, we wonder. We got to wonder. Anything happening? Um, Barr has also said that, that his review would include uh, an examination of former British intelligence officer Christopher Steele's thing. How do you think that's going to go? Do you think that Barr looking into the Christopher Steele thing Do you think there's any chance that will not surface terrible stories about the behavior of old white guys in the Democrat Party? Democratic Party? I don't know. Let's talk about something else. Um, Let's talk about cheating China. Cheating China, that's that's what I'm going to call them now. Fentanyl China wasn't catching on as well as I'd hoped. But have you noticed that China cheats on everything? Uh, recently they got disqualified in some kind of military world games, some kind of athletic event of people who were in the military, and the entire Chinese team got disqualified for cheating. They, I guess they, it doesn't matter how, but they cheated. How would you like to be China? And they care so much, apparently they care so much about winning this activity that they, they cheated, and it wasn't just some individuals, it looked like it was organized cheating on the China side. Well, that's not so good. You know, that's not a, a big deal. If it were all by itself, you'd say, yeah, it's a irrelevant competition. Nobody cares. But we also have in the news today that uh, South Korea decided to remove itself from the designation by the World Trade Organization as a developing nation. Now, what that means in practical terms is that 
they don't get some advantages of being labeled a disadvantaged company or country. So if you are a developed nation, if that's your designation under the World Trade Organization, I understand. I'm just learning this today. You get some trade benefits that you wouldn't get if you're a more developed country. The idea, of course, is to help the developing countries get a, get a little boost. So South Korea and China have been part of this developing nations thing forever. South Korea just said, well, it was getting a little embarrassing to be you know, one of the richest countries in the world and also taking these benefits of being a developing nation, so they voluntarily took themselves out. How much do you love South Korea? <laughs> Have you noticed that South Korea does a lot of good stuff? Like every time you hear a story out of South Korea, it feels like nine out of ten stories out of South Korea are something awesome, you know, where you say, wow, that felt like something they did for us, right? Didn't, doesn't it feel like South Korea removing itself from that designation? It felt like they did that for us. And what I mean is it puts pressure on, this is the way the story is being told, it puts pressure on China to do the same thing. And that's going to be really expensive for China. <laughs> I don't know how expensive, but apparently it's a big deal. So China is sort of cheating on the WTO, which we could not have said while South Korea, our ally, was doing the same thing. It would have been hard for us to criticize China while our buddies South Korea are taking advantage of the exact same system. South Korea just pulled themselves out of it voluntarily because they said it was, basically, they said it would be embarrassing to continue using this advantage when they no longer really qualified for it. China, or cheating China, still doing it. Cheating China made a deal with, uh, with Hong Kong to give them autonomy, and then they, they tried to cheat on that deal. Cheating China makes deals with con- uh, companies from other countries and then tries to steal their IP every time. Cheating China. Cheating China tries to um, <laughs> send us fentanyl and act like they said they were going to do something about it, but then they don't. Well, Cheat in China is proving itself not worthy for business. I've said this before, but there needs to be, I, I think there needs to be some kind of global designation for countries that says whether they're business worthy. Just, that's just it. It doesn't matter what their, um, what their government is or what they're doing to their people. Those are separate questions. Important, but separate. Uh, I think there should be some kind of rating that says a country can be depended on to do what they say they're going to do, or they're just flat-out criminals. And if you get involved with them, they're just going to try to steal your stuff. There should be a rating for that, for international, or for countries. Not just companies, but countries. And I would say that China has very clearly um, identified itself as a country that you should not do business with. Because you don't want to get in business with somebody who intends to cheat. And that's the difference. It'd be one thing if people, you know, people had different motivations, but you figure everybody's going into it with the right intentions. But if you know for sure that somebody intends to cheat, why would you do business with them? It makes no sense that we have uh, ongoing plans to do more business with China. So decoupling, I think, is uh, going to happen one way or another. Um, We're starting to see people uh, acknowledge that the connection between China and the Mexican cartels is so strong now because China's uh, government is allowing, and I say allowing, meaning intentionally allowing, their drug dealers to ship fentanyl in large quantities to Mexico, where the Mexicans turn it into products and ship it across the border and kill people like my stepson. So uh, we're, I, I think it was on Tucker last night, somebody was talking about how you really have to start seeing this as uh, a crime syndicate. 
you have to see it as sort of a, a terrorist crime syndicate, meaning that the Chinese government, and really if they're allowing their companies to do it, you have to put the, the responsibility on the government because they can stop it. They obviously choose not to, and they've been asked to and promised they would and still chose not to. So that's the government. You can't just say there's some bad actors in China. It's the government. So the government of China is partnering with Mexican drug cartels to ship weapons of mass destruction into the United States to kill Americans by the tens of thousands every year. Maybe 50,000 this year? 50,000 dead from Chinese terrorists? And by that I mean the government of China? President Xi, who I think has to be called a terrorist at this point. Let me be the first to say it. President Xi is willingly and intentionally and publicly, publicly, allowing companies that they could easily stop shipping fentanyl to this country, a weapon of mass destruction, with the intention that the Mexican cartel will weaponize it, ship it across our border, and kill tens of thousands of people. What does that make President Xi? A terrorist. He is a terrorist. There's no way you can soften that. President Xi is an international terrorist. Prove me wrong. There's not one thing I said that isn't a fact agreed by every observer. Every observer agrees with what I just said. President Xi is intentionally and publicly allowing his Chinese companies to ship fentanyl to Mexican cartels for the purpose of shipping it into the United States and knowingly killing tens of thousands of people. He's actually a terrorist. And I think we could just designate him as such, or at least threaten to designate him as such, if he keeps it up. Here's the thing. If we sign a deal with China for trade, let me say this clearly. Let me go on record, all right? You're not going to like what I'm going to say next. But I'm going to say it anyway. If President Trump, the Trump administration, signs a trade deal with China of any kind prior to the obvious stop of fentanyl, I'm going to change my support to Buttigieg. And I'm going to go full Buttigieg. All right? So he's going to lose me on that. If we sign a trade deal with China before fentanyl completely stops, and it's obvious it's stopped, I'm going to back Buttigieg, assuming the primaries are still on. That's a promise. All right, um, because he's the best. <laughs> he's the best on the other side. <clears throat> because there's no way in the fucking world I'm going to support a president who supports an international terrorist. You know, if Obama said, "Hey, let's throw in with uh, Al Qaeda. Let's uh, let's make a trade deal with Al Qaeda." Would you support Obama if he made a trade deal with Osama bin Laden? Well, of course not. Of course not. If you were a Democrat and you loved Obama and then he made a trade deal with Osama bin Laden, would you say, well, I don't like that, but I'm still on his side? No, you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. You'd say, what frickin' craziness is this that the president just made a trade deal with an international terrorist? How many people did bin Laden kill? What, three or 4,000? How many people has President Xi killed in this country? couple hundred thousand? Not even close. Not even close. Al-Qaeda didn't come close to what China is doing every day, right now, today. China will probably kill more people this week in the United States than Al-Qaeda ever killed. So President Xi is an international terrorist. I support no deal, trade deal with China. And if we sign one without fentanyl, I'm going to switch sides. Um, Let's talk about something else. By the way, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think we're going to have a trade deal with China because we can't. There's just no way to get there. 
I don't see any way to get there. For a comprehensive one, we might have some deals on small stuff. All right, um, Russia had some big uh, convention where they had a lot of African nations meet with them. Uh, and mostly it was about selling them weapons. So Russia has decided one of their main sources of income going forward is selling lots of Russian arms to African nations. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> now, are we a little bit responsible for that? Because uh, I asked myself, is, if Russia had a choice of how to make money, is this the way they'd do it? Would they say, yeah, let's sell weapons to Africa? Because you know those weapons are going to get used. It feels as though Russia you know, is like any country. They're trying to make money. They need money. I mean, Putin needs to have you know, a good economy in order to stay in power, even though he's a, a dictator. He still needs a good economy. Um, and I wonder if, if the Russian opportunities for income are so constrained now, partly because, I don't know, maybe sanctions have something to do with it, but maybe it has more to do with the Russian government is so corrupt that they don't have you know, a regular economy. It's just these oligarchs. So it might be that there are some oligarchs who make so much money from the arms industry, and the arms industry is so important to the economy. It could be that that's all Russia has. It may be that Russia's best play is to kill millions of Africans. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's an exaggeration, right? If, if Russia is planning to sell weapons to 30 African countries, do you think they're all on the same side? <laughs> I don't think so. Feels like, it feels like the obvious long-term implication of that is that Russia will have killed probably millions of Africans who may not have had such a large war or such a destructive war without all those awesome Russian weapons. Uh, so I asked myself, what could fix that? And I don't think there's anything, because you'd have to put the Russian uh, weapons makers out of business. And I don't think there's any way to do that, is there? Is there anything that would stop the Russian weapons maker oligarchs from selling weapons to Africa. I can't think of anything. Now, well, unless I suppose if we had some way to put immense pressure on the countries that are buying it so that they didn't buy it, you know, maybe there's some way, something you can do there, but I don't know what to do about that. But I would say if you were to, if you were to project forward, what does Africa look like in 10 years? Probably completely a war. My guess is that the, the, next, um, the next Middle East is going to be Africa, meaning that you know, the Middle East might actually settle down, relatively speaking, war-wise, whereas Africa is just getting started. You know, there's tons of violence there, but once they get the good weapons, it goes to another level. All right, let's... Uh, so we talked about cheating China. Let's talk about Kanye West. Uh, he's converted, uh, he said that uh, he had a conversion in April after he went to Coachella, and apparently uh, God helped him beat his addictions to pornography and sex. So Kanye West has said he's, been, he's had a pornography problem since his first Playboy he saw as a, as a kid, and he, uh, I was going to say he just beat it, but that's probably the wrong choice of words. Yeah, I'm not going to say he beat it. <clears throat> I'll say that he discontinued his addictions. And he asked some people working on his project to not have premarital sex. Pretty sure that went over really well. That's a good way to get your, get your team on the same page. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wonder about his, uh, his conversation with his team. Don't you wonder what that meeting looked like? You know, Kanye calls a meeting of all his team, production team or whoever's working with him on his project. He's like, hey, team, you're the best team ever. And the team is like, whoa, yay. Our, our next product, people are going to buy it. They're going to love it. Yay, team. 
you guys are great. You're smart. You, you work hard. I love every one of you. And they're all, yay, Kanye, yay. One other thing. Just, just one other item before we end the meeting. There's just one thing I need you to do for me. What is it? What is it? We'll do anything for you, Kanye. Yay. I just need you to stop having premarital sex. Quiet. Um, sorry, I think I heard that wrong, Kanye. What, what were you asking us? Uh, I'd like you to not have premarital sex because it's not good for you and God, um, God insists. Um, how long is this project going to last? A few months. Just a few months. Um, can I put my resume together now? So I got a feeling that that, uh, that suggestion didn't go over so well with the staff. Uh, but anything that Kanye does is worth watching. And his conversion to uh, full-out uh, God-loving is probably more interesting than you think. Because on the surface, you say to yourself, pretty traditional, right? It's somebody who's born again in some sense, uh, maybe not technically born again, but um, somebody who's just decided to commit themselves to God. And you say to yourself, well, I've seen that a million times. I kind of know what that looks like. <laughs> somebody says, is Muslim next? No, I don't think he's going to turn to Islam. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but he, he had, I saw one phrase that suggested there's something bigger coming, like much bigger. And he talked about God being sort of everywhere and everything. And in some sense, that's a, a, a typical way to speak of God, that it's everything and everywhere. Um, and I don't know that this is going to happen. But keep in mind that Kanye is not normal. And I mean that in a good way. He's, he's a creator. So if you take you know, religion that's existed forever and you take a normal person and they become a religious convert, the person gets folded into the religion and then the religion stays the same, but the person changed. Kanye is not like that ordinary person who changed and became more like the religion. Kanye is as big as the religion, as powerful as the religion. Now, I'm not going to say he's more powerful than God. I'm talking about just the way we think. Kanye's ability to change the way people think about stuff is sort of unparalleled. You know, um, maybe there's, you know, Trump, maybe. But he's got that world-class um, quality. So here's what I'm predicting. If you take a Kanye and you put him into a, a, a traditional religion, he changes the religion. That's the story. The story is not that religion changed Kanye, because that's what it looks like in the beginning, right? But Kanye is not going to leave religion the way it was. At the very least... He's going to elevate it to an art form because you see him doing that already, right? You've seen a number of famous people uh, recently have attended his, his outdoor um, Sunday services. They have music and, you know, it's, it's more of an event. And um, if you think about it, the people who attended that event were certainly thinking about God and maybe you felt God in their souls and stuff like that. But it really was about the, the people at that moment in that place. Like he used, he used religion, I think, you know, in, a, in an honest way, to make a change that affected just humans in their actual life at that moment while they're standing at this event. They're singing, they're communing with each other, they're meeting good people, they're just having a good time. I think what you should look for is Kanye to redefine religion. Not in any bad way, but actually to improve it, an actual upgrade. I think he's going to literally upgrade religion from something that maybe was uh, functional but had its rough edges 
choose something better, just, just a better design. I think he's going to redesign religion. You know, no, he's not going to change God or you know, the Bible or any of that. But I think he's going to redefine it by his, his personality, his charisma, and his creative force that's un, somewhat unparalleled. Okay, enough about that. Um, all right, uh, well, that's all I got, turns out. Turns out that's all I got. So I would like to ask you again to take a look at my book, Lose a Think. Uh, it's available now, and if you were to pick this up, uh, Amazon.com, one click, and it's all yours. Why wouldn't you? You should buy this because <laughs> because it's really the thing that, f- that fuels everything I do here. So if you like these periscopes, if you like me to do more of this stuff, buying the book is the way to show that, uh, that you're on board with that. And I would certainly appreciate it very, very much if you did. Thank you to all those who, who have already ordered it. I know a number of you have. Um, somebody, somebody says, no, thank you. It's called Loser. Well, it's Loser Think. So it's not about people. It's about unproductive ways of thinking. So it's not about any particular people. Uh, thoughts on the fight over the seven-year-old transition from boy to girl? No. No. I, I'm going to uh, recuse myself from that debate. Um, that debate, I just think, needs to be something that the family works out, and I hope the law is compatible with whatever they do. I just don't feel like that's my business, so I'm going to recuse myself from that. Um, well, thank, thank you to all of you who have already ordered the book. There's quite a few of you here, I see. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you. Why blue and orange cover? Uh, don't you think this is the best cover I've ever done? I don't know if, how many of you are aware of my other books, but I would say just in design, this might be the best cover I've ever done. That, that's my opinion. I think it is. All right. Um, I will talk to you all later.